Um, I rise to indicate that Labor will be supporting the Honourable uh, Mark Parnell's disallowance motions, uh, items, uh, orders of day, private business numbers 10 and 11. And I'll indicate that rather than speaking separately to both of them, as one relates to uh, regulations under the Development Act and one under the Native Vegetation Act, I'll speak to both 10 and 11 together in this one contribution, and then, uh, and then the opposition will be voting uh, to disallow those regulations. Uh, the first motion disallows the regulation under the Development Act regarding, a private, tourism, regarding private tourism developments worth more than a million dollars in Flinders Chase National Park. Uh, sir, developments in national parks are currently required to be consistent with each national park management plan and to go through the normal standard development approval process. Under the regulation, which is uh, before consideration of this chamber to disallow, development may be approved by the State Coordinator General and would not be subject to development plan consent nor appeal. Uh, the second motion um, uh, will uh, attempt to disallow regulations under the Native Title Vegetation Act regarding private tourism developments worth uh, more than $1 million in Flinders Chase National Park. Under this regulation, uh, any vegetation clearance required by the development may be approved by the State Coordinator General. Uh, at present, sir, as I said, developments in national parks require uh, not just the development plan consent but require native vegetation clearance and are subject to approval by the Native Vegetation Council. Uh, the council this council requires significant environmental benefit to offset any such clearance. Uh, the context of these regulations is a controversial proposal from the Australian Walking Company to build accommodation on cliff tops in Flinders Chase. Uh, this proposal uh, has been subject to an appeal launched by local uh, uh, interested groups. Uh, these regulations, if let to stand, would allow the company to proceed without being subject to public input in the development approval or being subject to any appeal. Uh, since the in introduction of these regulations and the subsequent disallowance motions, uh, the concerned groups in the company have uh, reached some agreements about, in a about a change of location for the accommodation. However, sir, uh, such negotiations agreements have been made in the knowledge that, this com that the company was able to get approval from the government regardless of the views of the local community due to the operations of the regulations that are the subject of this allowance. The introduction of these regulations has to be considered as an intentional shot across the bow of the local groups uh, that are opposed uh, to the government. Uh, and this is a deliberate attempt to sideline them and to take away proper protections. The regulations effectively gave the local groups no option uh, with a gun held to their head in the negotiations than, than to try and settle with the uh, development company. Uh, these regulations are not specific to that development but cover any private development in the park and are not time limited. Uh, we think they should be disallowed to avoid uh, any further controversial development not being subject to any approval or scrutiny. And uh, sir, I wish to, at this, at this stage to place on the record and acknowledge the, uh, the tireless work of the local member of the State Parliament, whose electorate includes Kangaroo Island, Leon Bingle, the member for Mawson. Uh, he has uh, spent a great deal of time, sir, uh, letting not just me but, uh, but many members of, uh, of, of this side of the chamber know his views about uh, these regulations. Uh, as the local member, as uh, uh, the member for Mawson, Leon Bignall, has implored that yeah, he's not against development, but it needs to be sensitive, sensible development, uh, development on Kangaroo Island to make sure that environmental concerns are taken into account and that it works properly for the benefit of everyone. Uh, sir, I know I spent uh, at some time, uh, 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 almost this time last year, on Kangaroo Island with the member for Mawson, Leon Bignall, in the, uh, in the wake of the bushfires, do, yeah, helping uh, with uh, a blaze aid, clean up fencing and, and meeting with members of the local community. And I, I certainly know and share uh, the member for Mawson's concern that as bushfire recovery continues, the, uh, the wishes of the local uh, people on Kangaroo Island are not trampled on as these regulations uh, seek to do. Um, we are very fortunate, I think, uh, sir, on this side of the chamber to have someone uh, like the member for Mawson, Leon Bignall, who is in touch with the community on Kangaroo Island, be able to inform us of the wishes and needs of the Kangaroo Island community and, uh, and working together uh, to, to bring about uh, better results. We think these regulations, sir, are another unfortunate example by this government to degrade our shrinking natural habitats. 
regulations like these can turn uh, amazing and timeless natural treasures into nothing but resources to be squeezed for cash, regardless of the destruction, uh, degradation or views of those uh, in the area. We've seen it uh, before in this term of parliament, sir, with cuts to marine parks where the only real threat of disallowing the regulations forced the environment minister uh, at that stage into retreat. We've seen it so with uh, the issues uh, with the Murray River, with the minister being found uh, by a report to have capitulated to the interests of irrigators in the eastern states to the detriment of South Australians and South Australia's waterways. Uh, we've seen uh, even more recently the shambolic handling of the death of more than 10 hectares of mangroves and 30 hectares of sandfire wetlands near St Kilda. Uh, it was likely caused by hypersaline water seeping from a ne nearby salt mining ponds. Sir, we have a Minister for the Environment in name only, with almost all of the funding committed in last year's budget going to the building of, of uh, facilities in national parks and very, very little to the protection of our precious biodiversity and natural resources. Uh, sir, there needs to be a line drawn in the sand. Both of these regulations are contrary to uh, Labor's policy on development in national parks. Uh, uh, and it's contrary to our views while in government and in opposition, and we wholeheartedly support the Honourable Mark Parnell's motion to disallow them. Uh, call the Treasurer. Mr President, the government poses the uh, motion from the Honourable Member. Uh, Mr President, with the recent devastating Kangaroo Island bushfires and the ongoing impact of COVID-19, it's important from the government's viewpoint that the local economy, that tourism ventures that generate local jobs are enabled in a way that carefully manages our environmental assets. Mr President, as we emerge from COVID, uh, we indicated in last year's budget uh, that this government was uh, um, uh, budget and its uh, two-year stimulus package was predicated on the basis of saving as many businesses as we could, but also saving as many jobs and creating as many jobs as we could. And, Mr President, uh, uh, for those areas that have been doubly impacted not only by COVID in terms of the impact on tourism but also impacted by the devastation of bushfires. Um, uh, any venture, Mr President, any sensible venture which is going to actually create local jobs for local communities uh, we believe is worthy of serious consideration and support. Now, Mr President, one of an example of development frustrated by the current planning regime is the existing Kangaroo Island Wilderness Trail. The existing visiting infrastructure existing visitor infrastructure in the Adelaide Walking Company's ecologically sensitive accommodation and ancillary facilities and infrastructure within Flinders Chase National Park. The variations in the Development Regulations 2008 made under the Development Act 1993 prescribes that a tourism development in the Flinders Chase National Park, where it exceeds $1 million in development cost, does not require planning consent and would instead be approved by the State Coordinator General. The ecotourism project along the uh, uh, Kangaroo Island um, um, Wilderness Trail Mr. President, will go ahead uh, after the, um, the Adelaide Walking Company and local environmental groups reached an agreement and settled the matter in the Supreme Court. And Mr. President, uh, I'm advised that on the 9th of February it was publicly announced that the Supreme Court action taken by EcoAction against uh, the uh, Adelaide Walking Company, Mr. President, um, had been resolved between the parties and further that the State Coordinator General had pro has provided approval to AWC for the development to occur. And we welcome that sensible resolution, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, AWC has now received approval to build eco-sensitive accommodation pods along the Kangaroo Island Wilderness Trail after making changes to their original plans. The development approval reflects the agreement established with all the parties and ensures that native vegetation clearance conditions including pre-clearance surveys and threatened species management plans are undertaken prior to any development on site. The project will de deliver positive economic and environmental outcomes for Kangaroo Island. The partnership comes with the support of the, uh, the Liberal government, which worked with the two parties and other community stakeholders in a process to reimagine visitor experiences on Kangaroo Island. This proposal has followed the precedent set for a number of developments by which the development regulations exempt certain developments from the requirement to comply with section 331A, providing that the development is approved by the State Coordinator General. Similar changes were made to facilitate the development of the SA Motorsport Park at Tail and Bend, as well as other developments specified in Schedule 1A of the development regulations. 
The effect of the regulation is that it excludes, as I said earlier, the developments from a requirement to be assessed against the development plan, but still preserves building rules, uh, consent and other aspects of the planning regime. So, Mr President, uh, for those reasons, the, uh, the government will be opposing uh, the motion from the honourable member. As I said, in conclusion, uh, the government, in all that it's doing at the moment, where it can sensibly, it wants to save as many businesses as we can, we want to save as many jobs as we can, and we want to create as many new jobs as we can in terms of coping with the impact of not only COVID-19, but in this uh, particular part of uh, the state, uh, the devastating impact of the bushfires as well. Uh, the Honourable oh, Miss, Miss Franks. Yes, I did say that, Mr President. Um, thank you, Mr President. Look, I'm not the portfolio holder for the Greens for this particular uh, motion, or indeed, as the Honourable Kayam Ma noted, we've got a little omnibus of them here. This is not the first time we've had this debate, but indeed so many people have written to me, Mr President, um, absolutely horrified about what this government is doing in this area. I feel compelled to highlight again to this chamber the strength of the Greens' uh, vehemence and opposition to um, these regulations and why we will continue to disallow them. We cannot allow private vested interests to win out over public good, Mr President. Indeed, I know that uh, um, the Marshall government has been called out here yet again by my colleague, the Honourable Mark Parnell, mm -hmm for trying to fast-track major private tourism projects with no oversight or accountability and, indeed, making a joke out of our planning laws. And, indeed, any claim that they may make, Mr President, of protecting the environment when this is deforestation and privatisation from, by stealth is uh, certainly the sentiment of the correspondence I've received. And, again, I iterate, um, I'm covering both the Development Act regulations and the Native Vegetation Act regulations, as the Honourable Kayam Ma did. Private developers would not need planning consent for tourism-related developments in the iconic National Park. Under the Native Vegetation Act regulations, developers and developers could clear unspecified amounts of native veg inside Flinders Chase without needing to seek approval. What a disgrace. Private developers' development belongs on private land. Public land belongs in public hands. What the government is trying to do here is open the door to private developers and set a standard that it's fine to have private developments in other national parks as well, without any consideration of the damage that this kind of development might bring, likely will bring, if these regulations in their uh, omnibus of, uh, in, as we debate today are allowed to stand. We are allowing public parks, national parks, to be carved up for profit. Indeed. Um, it seems to be, if it's nature, you know, it's up for privatisation and profiteering under this Marshall Liberal government and with this particular environment minister. Private developers should not be intruding on our public spaces, but not only our public spaces, our parks and reserves. And it's appalling that this government keeps encouraging them to do so, not just encouraging but enabling them by waiving developmental and environmental requirements and protections to help their developer mates. This is a game of mates, Mr President, and the developers are certainly the ones who will profit from it. We should be taking every step possible to preserve and protect our national parks, not privatise and develop them. The changes proposed by the government that we here in the Greens and the community seek to disallow are done under the guise of bushfire recovery and indeed I'm stumped as to how allowing new development here whilst waving away the very basic requirements that would protect native vegetation has anything to do with that. Flinders Chase is a globally recognised flora and fauna diversity hotspot and the National Park was created and dedicated to the purpose of preserving flora and fauna over 100 years ago. There is long established evidence that shows us protected areas must be preserved, yet this government seems determined to privatise, monetise, commercialise and exploit any vestige of untouched natural wonder that they can find. Now, the, honour oh, the Honourable Minister, you're listed on the next one. So, yeah, yeah, so uh, what, what I, some, some members have spoken to both matters on, on this one item. Uh, but the, you, Minister, are listed on the next one. So, we'll, 
So I'll call the Honourable Mr Parnell to conclude the debate on this uh, development matter. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. And, um, uh, I will, uh, in some ways similar to other members, um, make most of my comments in relation to this item. But uh, in the course of recent conversations I've had with some colleagues, I think I do need to make some additional explanations in the second uh, item. And I note that the government has separate speakers for both items as well. But the bulk of my contribution will be to this item. And I will start by thanking the Hon. Kaya Mar, the Hon. Rob Lucas and the Hon. Tammy Franks for their contributions. Um, on behalf of South Australia's uh, conservation movement, uh, I thank the Labor Party for their support uh, for the motion. Um, it will be no surprise to anyone that the entirety of the conservation movement in South Australia uh, is opposed uh, to these regulations. Um, but I, I do know that um, some of my colleagues on the crossbench have received uh, some conflicting and, in fact, misinformation, I think, from the government. So I, I will be addressing my comments largely to my uh, crossbench uh, colleagues because I'm not sure that they necessarily appreciate the stakes involved uh, in relation to uh, these two lots of regulations, but I'll start with the development regulations. And um, I also want to uh, put on the record my thanks to just a couple of groups in particular, the uh, Field Naturalist Society of South Australia. It's got to be one of our oldest conservation groups, established 1883, older than any member uh, in this chamber, 1883. And their letter uh, to the minister uh, says, it is with great sadness but unshakable resolve that I write to you on behalf of the Field Naturalist Society of South Australia to express our dismay at the state government's recent move to introduce new regulations uh, to override existing protections. And similarly, the, um, the people who know this park better than anyone else, the friends of parks, the ones who are there every day doing work in the park, uh, the friends of parks, uh, KI, Western Districts, and their letter includes uh, a letter addressed to the crossbench mainly. I'm not sure who else got it, but um, it says, for more than two years, we've been fighting to preserve the environmental integrity of Flinders Chase National Park, one of the most iconic and biologically important natural areas left in South Australia from inappropriate private tourism developments on remote and pristine coastal headlands in what we argue was blatant disregard for the legally binding park management plan. I'll come back to something they say in a, in a little while, but they're, they're two key groups um, and my conversations with other conservation groups are along, similar, along a similar vein. There have also been a number of developments since I moved this motion, and I do feel the need to put those on the records. This is new information. I'm not going to re-agitate what I said before. But I will start uh, with this court case uh, that uh, the Treasurer has referred to and other members know about it. A long-standing court case, Kangaroo Island Eco Action, the longest standing conservation group on the island, challenging uh, various processes in relation to the uh, Kangaroo Island Wilderness Trail private accommodation. You might have seen some of the protests on the steps. What the banners were saying, get back on the track. And that's in fact what they've managed to succeed in doing. They have managed to uh, convince uh, the walking company and the government that having these private accommodations miles, kilometres <laughs> away from the track on pristine coastal headlands was not the appropriate way to go. And whilst we don't know, in fact, what the new location is, uh, we do know from anecdotally that it will be closer to the actual wilderness trail. It won't be on those prominent headlands uh, that were there before. Um, so we can look at that as some level of success. Uh, but mind you, um, it wasn't something that uh, all conservationists supported, and in fact, even those who, through gritted teeth, have signed off on it, um, are unhappy with the process. And I'll come back to the friends of Kangaroo Island, friends of Parks, KI Western District. They say, the day before, we were due to meet with a departmental consultant to negotiate in good faith a resolution to this long-standing dispute, and the week before the case was due to appear in court, the government introduced this regulation thus forcing us to effectively negotiate with a gun to our heads. So the, the settlement that uh, the minister and others are very proud of uh, it was achieved uh, by virtue of introducing regulations, the effect of which is, well, you know, we hold the whip hand. We will do whatever we want. You'd better reach agreement with us. Um, on the 9th of February, uh, Minister Spears was on ABC radio 
uh, Radio Adelaide. He says, I'm delighted that we've achieved a mediated outcome where the ecopods will go ahead but in, a, in an altered form. They will be in less invasive spots and closer to the trail. They won't need as much native vegetation clearance. I should just say that, uh, by way of an aside, Mr President, that I do love the phrase ecopod. Sounds very small, very cosy, very low key. One of the buildings is 18 metres long, 9 metres wide and 4 metres high. Um, it's bigger than, bigger than some houses, uh, uh, and it's in a national, uh, national park. The interview with Minister Spears on 891, ABC 891 continued. Uh, David Bevan asked the question, does this mean the Vicky Chapman regulations, which would have allowed pretty much the government to do whatever it liked in a national park, the government will drop those? That's the question. Uh, Spears, uh, I'll say Spears, it's got the media monitoring, says Spears, uh, I believe Mark Parnell has moved a disallowance motion in the upper house. The project is now approved. It was approved in a way that wouldn't have needed those regulations in the first place, so it becomes a bit of a moot point. So there's the minister on radio saying uh, that these regulations are a moot point, um, and yet we've got the government saying that they're opposing uh, disallowance. But the minister then went on to make quite an outrageously false claim uh, that my disallowance motion somehow affected the rebuilding of the Southern Ocean Lodge, which was destroyed in last summer's bushfires. The minister said, there's actually other regulations which came in at the same time to help facilitate the rebuild of Southern Ocean Lodge, which is a critical anchor product in South Australia's tourism economy. So unfortunately, Mr Parnell has moved to disallow both sectors' regulations, and we really need Southern Ocean Lodge to be re-established, so hopefully they won't be disallowed in Parliament. Now, that was a bizarre statement. Now, luckily, uh, I think the interviewer was, was on the ball a little bit and, and gave the minister a chance to recover. And David Bevan says, but these regulations would allow you to do pretty much whatever you like in those parks, uh, so you say you still might need them for Southern Ocean? That's the question. Uh, Spears, oh, this is not in the park, so we wouldn't need them for this project. So he's immediately contradicted what he said earlier, which is that the Parnell disallowance motion is a problem for Southern Ocean Lodge. Now, we are all used to ministers being vague and confused, and I normally don't let it get to me unless the minister's confusion misrepresents what I'm trying to do or what my party is trying to do. So the minister is responsible uh, for his own utterances, but I suspect that the reason for his confusion is that there is another part of the Government Gazette uh, which effectively says that the old major development approval for Southern Ocean Lodge that dates back to 2004, that that can be revived because what they're proposing to do is to rebuild basically what was burnt down in the same location, in the same form. It's an entirely different part of the Government Gazette. It doesn't relate to these regulations at all. So if people are thinking that this is uh, somehow a backdoor method of preventing Southern Ocean Lodge being rebuilt, the minister was wrong. Uh, he's he's half-heartedly corrected uh, the, the record, but I want to make that really clear uh, on the record. These regulations uh, only apply in the park. Southern Ocean Lodge is declared a major project. The normal planning rules don't apply to major projects, so put that from your minds. Um, Minister Spears then says in relation to the future use of these regulations, he says, I don't believe they will be used. So in other words, the government's saying that they're opposing the disallowance of these regulations, the Environment Minister saying he doesn't believe they uh, will be used. Now, the fact is, Mr President, they have been used. They have been used. Um, the Minister said on radio, the project is now approved. It was approved in a way that wouldn't have needed those regulations in the first place, so it becomes a bit of a moot point. But leaving that moot point bit aside, he, he said that it had been, the development had been approved. Um, so, I'm not sure whether he was saying, I don't believe they will be used, whether he, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He, I think what he meant was, again, we won't need to use them again, because they have clearly used them already. And I'll explain that because there is a timeline that's important here. The regulations were put into place on the 21st of January. They have done their job. They have done their, their dirty work. They have been used to approve already multiple private buildings in Flinders Chase National Park without requiring planning consent and with zero consultation. So the regs came in on the 21st of January. They were tabled in Parliament on the 2nd of February. I immediately gave notice of intention to move disallowance uh, on the 2nd of February, and that's what we're now uh, debating. Uh, also on the 2nd of February, 
Um, I asked the Treasurer, representing the Attorney General, a question in Parliament. I, the question I asked was, uh, did the minister encourage the Australian Walking Company to take advantage of the new regulations, gazetted on 21 January, to lodge a new development application for private tourism infrastructure inside Flinders Chase National Park? That was my question. The answer came back on 7 February, no. Now, my initial reaction was, well, that can't be true. But then I realised, of course, <laughs> is that uh, I do accept that the Attorney General herself probably offered no personal encouragement. Um, my question wasn't addressed to the Environment Minister uh, or to the Environment Department, uh, who clearly uh, are behind this and who have reached an agreement uh, with the walking company for them to be able to uh, advance their project without it requiring uh, planning consent. Um, so the, uh, the Environment Department certainly, and I suspect the Minister, uh, certainly knew that these regulations would probably be, be disallowed. Um, uh, because they are an outrageous breach of proper planning processes. So the developers had to act fast. They had the full support of the department, uh, even if the uh, Minister for Planning, the Attorney General, wasn't in the loop. Um, so I also asked the attorney on the 2nd of uh, uh, February the question uh, whether an application had been lodged. And the response that came back on the 7th of February was, while I have no statutory role in the process, I have been advised that an application has been lodged. Now, while the attorney might not have known when she responded to my question, uh, she might have known that an application had been lodged, but she may not have known that it had been approved five days earlier. Because, in fact, that date, the 2nd of February, the date the regulations were tabled in Parliament was the date the project was approved. All I did on the 2nd of February was give notice of intention to move disallowance. I didn't speak to it till the private members day the following day. But by the time I spoke, by the time I got up on the 3rd of February, the project had already been approved under these regulations. They have done the job that the government set out for them uh, to do. Now, I'm still at a loss as to what the new development is. Um, we're told that it's closer to the track. Uh, we're told it's not on the prominent coastal headlands anymore, but we don't know exactly where it is. And the reason for that, some people might have thought my question in question time yesterday was quite cryptic. The reason for that is the government's web page is so hopelessly compromised with failed security certificates that no web browser will allow you to open the decision notification form uh, that tells you exactly what's been approved. Um, I thought if I asked the question yesterday, I'd give the government some time just to, to fix up the website. Nah. It's still, still not fixed. Um, anyway, so that all happened on the 2nd of uh, January. Um, and I do know, because whilst the decision notification form isn't available, um, I do, did manage to find on the government's public register uh, two applications lodged on the 2nd of February. And then you go to the tab which says assessment. Uh, and the assessment says decision granted, uh, decision date 2nd February. So what that tells you is that um, it all went according to plan. Uh, the regulations were introduced. They did their job. The walking company now has planning approval for something we don't know what, something a bit different, hopefully better, than what they had before. So these regulations, in relation to the Australian walking company, have no more work to do. There is nothing left for these regs to do. But it is still important that they be disallowed. And I will make the point that disallowing these regulations today will not affect the approval that the walking company has. It will not retrospectively um, impact on that decision. They've got their approval. They didn't need planning consent, because that's what the regulations do. You don't need planning consent, just like a, a pergola in your backyard. You don't need planning consent. But you do need building rules approval, and they've got that. They got that the same day they lodged their application. So nothing we do in relation to these development regulations impacts on uh, the walking company. Um, so if they have no further work to do, why does the government want to keep them on the statute books? And again, we go back to Minister Spears' uh, interview with David Bevan on the radio last week. And David Bevan, I quite like this question, so why don't you just drop them? Why don't you just tell Vicky that you had a rush of blood to the head? We don't need them anymore. We've got a deal. Everybody's walked away, and they've been quite reasonable about this, so can we just drop them? I thought that was a very good question. And the answer that the minister gave was, as a government, we remain committed to those regulations because they may be required as part of a broader reimagining 
a reimagining of the Western End. We've got some work to do in there. I don't believe they will be used, but a, a, government, but as, uh, but a government can have those in our back pocket in case they are needed. I don't expect that to be the case going forward. I don't expect to be taking any projects that would require those regulations, but we still believe we need them in the toolkit just in case. So it will be interesting to see what the upper house does. That's the question. So what members need to take from that is that if these regulations stand on the books, uh, what the government will do is they will probably talk to some people about appropriate projects or whatever, but if they get any pushback, if they get the sort of pushback they got from the Friends of Parks or KI Eco Action or the Conservation Council or the Field Naturalists, if they get pushback, they will have in their back pocket regulations which say we can do whatever we want in Flinders Chase National Park, provided it's a tourism development and provided they're going to spend a million bucks. We don't need to consult anyone. We don't need to get planning consent. We can just do it. Now, the question for the chamber today is, is that the regime that we think should apply to the future of this national park going forward? Forget the walking company, forget the ecopods. Whether you think that's a great project or not is irrelevant. These regulations now are about what happens in this iconic national park going forward. If there's going to be future development, should it go through a proper process of assessment or should we allow these regulations uh, that effectively give the government uh, the sign-off power without having to consult anyone, without having to undergo any process uh, at all? So that's the dilemma that uh, the minister is saying that if other private developers come along and they want a chunk of Flinders Chase National Park for their private tourism projects, then he wants the ability to approve those projects without it requiring planning consent with no public or expert consultation or any of the checks and balances that should accompany development anywhere, um, notwithstanding, or especially rather, uh, in our most important national park. So in short, these regulations, if allowed to stand, provide carte blanche for the government to approve any future tourist development inside the national park that it wants. Provided it's worth more than $1 million, it's inside the national park and it's for tourism and the government likes it, it can go ahead uh, with virtually no assessment other than a public servant deciding how much money they need to put into the kitty if they clear any vegetation. And we'll come to those regs uh, next. So, in conclusion, Mr. President, regardless of a person's views or a member's views on development in National Park, the very least that a parliament should do is to insist that proper processes be followed, that those processes be rigorous, transparent, and accountable. And to achieve that end, these regulations have to be disallowed. And I disagree most strongly with what the Treasurer said. He, he makes the point that we all know they've had a tough time on Kangaroo Island. You know, they've had the most horrendous fires. But you cannot then say, because a community has had a tough time with fires, the only solution to job creation is to remove all accountability, all checks and balances, and for the government to be the sole arbiter of what should happen inside a national park. That, that, that is illogical in the extreme. Uh, we all want the kangaroo island economy to do better. We know that tourism is an important part of it. But um, when it comes to development in na developments in national parks, these are the areas set aside on behalf of the community in the name of the community for the preservation of nature. It's not to say nothing can ever happen there, but if it does, it should go through the most thorough process. Uh, these regulations uh, prevent that proper process from occurring, and that's why the Greens are saying they need to be disallowed.